Is your team not performing well? Is morale low and turnover high? Are you falling further behind the competition? I'm here to help. I'm Shani Magoski, and this is The Leadershifter Show, where business strategy and culture finally meet. Explore shifts of all kinds required to build cultures of trust, engagement, and execution excellence. I promise I am not your typical boring leadership consultant, and I will help you and your team get your shift together. All right, we are live. Leadershifters, welcome to another episode of the Leader Shifter Show with yours truly, Shady. And I am truly excited to interview today's guest. His name is Eric Holzapfel, and he is joining us from my favorite state, Colorado, where, as many of you know, I lived in Vail and Boulder for about 13 years. Eric, Dr. Eric is joining us from Loveland, and we're going to unpack his book that's coming out March 7th, so you're getting a sneak peek. The book is called uh, Profit with Present, The 12 Pillars of Mindful Leadership and how that impacts bottom line, top line and bottom line results. But don't worry, Dr. Eric is not just a mindfulness guru for you left brain people. He is also a long standing business person. He has been in the real estate industry for several decades. He was a professor at Colorado State University for 13 years. So you're gonna get both left and right brain Pearls of wisdom today from Dr. Eric. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll do my best. Appreciate being invited on. <laughs> Terrific. So tell us how you developed from a real estate career and added in, weaved in the mindfulness pieces. Yeah, I, I, I think it happened. Uh, out of necessity, as I was successful young, I was a CEO of a, a subsidiary of an Australian firm in my 20s, traveling all over the country at Western Canada and was in a Los Angeles base and traveling all over the place. And <clears throat> I was successful in all outward views. You know, I had the title, I had the Mercedes, I had the apartment on the waterfront, uh, but I was miserable inside. I was stressed, I was overweight, you know, I was an athlete, but I hadn't done anything in five years. Uh, and I just had an, I got transferred to Boston. I had an epiphany moment where I just uh, said, you got to make some changes or you're not going to be around very long and you're just not happy. So I started making some changes. I left that company and I lost some weight and I started running again. And, and I decided to go back and get my PhD in economics, looking for more purpose. And I found yoga and that was my first entry into mindfulness. And it was, I was an athlete and it was like, I had become disassociated with my body, you know, and I got back in touch with my body and got back into athletics and took up golf and yoga and uh, met my wife and entered a PhD program. And uh, a couple of years into that, my oldest brother introduced me to meditation. He had been estranged kind of from my dad. He was a poet. My dad was a coach. And it was very stressful. And through meditation, I watched him get closer and closer, closer to my dad. And he opened up. My dad opened up. And I got my family back. And he said, you want to try it? And I said, heck, yeah. So I was a closet meditator for years. <laughs> and uh, then people... You know, I, I left the, I got my PhD, I started teaching part-time and I went back into real estate development on my own and started a firm and people started noticing a little bit at a time said, Hey, what's, what are you doing? There's changes in you. And one at a time I introduced people to mindfulness. We started a seed group at the company before I knew it, the room was full of people just talking about meditation and mindfulness and reading books. And then we brought mindful based stress reduction into the company and just notice tremendous differences in my, not just myself, but other people. So it, it kind of happened through necessity and a little bit at a time. Uh, yeah. But it's been a great journey. I've just seen the, the what a huge difference it makes for people. And, and, and more successful and they enjoy the ride. Yeah. Well, I can, I can say I joined you in discovering yoga when I was stressed and 
not totally unhappy, but not as happy as I could be as a VP at Goldman Sachs. And like it, the anxiety of working there and the expectations, and I was working on a trading desk. So nonstop treadmill 24 seven of news cycle and markets from around the world that you had to digest and reading. And so finally, I'm just like, I need a tool to calm all this anxiety down. So I started going to yoga only on Sunday nights to kind of set me up for a little relaxation heading into Monday morning. And it grew from there for me as well. And I will say the meditation piece initially for me was, was less important. And it was about the physical activity, the asana on the mat. But soon I realized that the asana is really only a, a method to get us to the meditation. Yeah. That clears yeah. the nonsense from our heads. Um, yeah, and I, I find so many people that I run into say I can't meditate, and and uh, I find the body work helps, and I also find people start too much. Like we start people with two minutes of meditation. That if you try to start 10, 15, 20 minutes from the start, you're it's so busy, it's discouraging, it can be self defeating. So start small, you know, and over time your mind calms down and you look for more. Absolutely, I I love that, and you know another. Thing I want to comment on before we move on from this topic is what you just what you said that you had all the outward trappings of success, but you weren't happy. Yeah. I want to address those of you listening and watching. Is that you? Do you relate? Does that resonate? I think that is more common than any of us want to talk about. And so if that's the case, really listen up. And if you don't meditate, you should try it. It's not something that has to be in the closet anymore. Like you, you share that you were a closet meditator for many years. Well, it's become mainstream now and lots of companies have meditation yeah. rooms, yoga rooms. So really avail yourselves of those resources, your body, your mind, and your, your, your emotional status will, will thank you for that. Awesome. So, very well put. I love it. Um, so I also noticed that in addition to being a successful business person and a happy meditator who spreads the gospel and an and author, that you're also a facilitator for the Arbinger Institute. Yes. Are you familiar with it? Uh, am I familiar with it? It's one of the tools I use the most for my own yeah, interactions awesome. with the world. And I teach the, I mean, I don't teach the full class, but I teach the idea of in and out of the box yeah. and, and being, uh, and, and what it means to be in the boxes and how to get out of the boxes. And people just, without even reading any of the books, Leadership and Self-Deception, Anatomy of Peace, they get, Better than box, less than box. I deserve box and need to be seen as box. Yeah. So and tell me how uh, that works. Well, I, I think it's one of the, you know, I find that meditation makes me open to a lot of things, but that there is other things I need to uh, discover from, you know, my blind spots and ways of being and those kind of things. And yeah. Arbinger was one of the things that really helped. With that, the other thing I found is uh, company wise, some people will always be resistant to meditation. You know, I don't know if they bring it into religion or what, what it is, but or just that they don't want to do it. But we had, uh, I mean, Arbinger is mindfulness without meditation. Yes. And we we had no resistance to, you know, company wide mandatory Arbinger retreats. So I always say, you know, when you get into your own mindfulness practice first get so that you have achieved it you know with some stability before you share because we're still a very skeptical society even though the openness is there and it's happening be, be you know make sure you have some stability of yourself and then you also when you start introducing you may introduce some non-meditation uh techniques like arbinger that yeah. are just awesome for people just to start looking at different ways of being uh, and to see people as people, not just as 
gosh, how am I going to get them to do that for me? You know, right. rather it's no, they're a real person just like you are and just like your friends are. Yes. Makes a huge difference. So for those people who don't know what it, when you say ways of being, yeah, um, I, I know what it is. I use it on myself. I use it with, with clients and with executive teams. Most people are so accustomed to doing when you say ways of being, it, not yeah. everybody understands. So can you go a little deeper in that, please? Yeah, I and I'll regress just a little bit to to uh, lead into it is we've become kind of sold a bill of goods from culture that we do these things like go to the right schools, work hard, get the right job, you know, get married, have the big house and we get to take the vacations and someday we get to be happy, successful, yes. you know, content. And I've found that uh, from myself and others is that, first of all, you know, we always move the goalpost when we get to there and we see we got that house or we got yeah. this or that or we got, you know, it's not, you know, the vacation's not big enough. The house isn't big enough. We need the extra car. We got to have the Mercedes. We've got to fly private, whatever it is. We keep moving the goalpost. And and also science is now showing that if we're happier, we'll be more successful. So we're kind of like always waiting for this to get to this magic place where then we get to be happy. So ways of being is that. So what we do is say, picture yourself in that situation and put to happiness. And now let's try to be happy now, because who do you, who do you want to call someone that's waiting to be happy, meaning they're unhappy or someone that's happy or someone that's waiting to be successful, meaning they're unsuccessful or someone that's successful now. And I just think it, it improves business when you have that mindset. So a way of being just means Instead of thinking about the things and the material things and the places you want to go and how they'll make you happy, think about how grateful you are right now in this moment. And if you can be happy now, doesn't mean you don't want those things. It just means you know that you need to bring happiness to that situation. Yep. When you go on the golf course or you go on vacation, bring happiness out there. Don't think, oh, I'll go there and then I'll be happy. Because most of all those experiences are empty without your you know, yourself being there with the right mindset. Is that clear? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll dovetail on that to say, to, to underscore something that you said, which is, is we can't change our mindset unless we're changing the narrative in our head. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes we can't just be like, oh, I need to be happy. <laughs> yeah. And what you said is, thinking about what you're grateful for. And that I think is one of the best approaches for changing your thoughts so that you can be happy instead of, you know, fill the blank with all the other things, which are not the most productive ways of being to accomplish the things that you're doing. Yeah. It puts you in the mind of a receiver and starting to notice, you know, I'm already receiving so many great things, you know, from my family and from, God and from the world and from the sun and what are all these great things. And if I start being happy for that, they find that there's, you know, there's an after image where I just look for other things to be grateful for. And I also find this, that's the person who gets the calls, you know, well, yeah. I call somebody that's going to actually care about how my day is going and it'll make me feel better. Not just a grinder that's just interested in the deal. Yep. You know, we all have to deal with some people like that. But if I have a choice, who am I going to call? You know, I'm going to call the person that makes me feel bigger, not the person that makes me feel smaller. Absolutely. There's like a magnetism to that mm -hmm. mindset that manifests even when, you know, it's not something you say, oh, I'm happy. You should talk to me. It's a way of being that you, when you show up that people are magnetized to. Absolutely. I, I find it it's a business generator. You know, that and and plus, why do we want all those things? We want all those things to be happy. You know, so let's be yeah. happy. Yep. And to, to your point earlier, money, status, power, uh, material things actually don't make people happy above like a, a very 
defined kind of low level. Like, seventy five or eighty thousand dollars, they say in the U.S. that it you know it increases material goods enough to make you happier, but beyond that, you just add more things to your and, list and more complications. Yeah. Which which in my experience diminish your happiness. Yeah. <laughs> and I say there's no nothing wrong with any of those things and, and you may gain some, you know, satisfaction, but if you bring happiness to them versus continually look for the next thing that's going to make you happy. My experience, Absolutely. that isn't how it works. Yep. All right. So let's get into the nitty gritty of the book, which again, folks coming out March 7th, so less than two or about two weeks. It's super exciting and congratulations. Thank you. So I believe that the 12 pillars of mindful leadership is the bulk of the content. So can you walk us through the concept and maybe a few of the principles? Yeah, I'll give, I mean, the, the guiding ones, I mean, some of the structure, some of the pillars are structural, you know, the basis and some are, are really basically simple mindset things. So uh, the first one is to be present and practice mindfulness. I find that to be present or here now, to be in the present moment requires some practice that we've spent years learning not to be present. Yes. I mean, everything that we have from our, you know, all the distractions that we have. It takes some, it takes some work to bring, get that back. And it takes an intention. And, and uh, so that's, that's number one. Number two is discover your purpose in life. And I find, you know, I taught at the university for 20 years. I'm just amazed at the top seniors that would come in in business school and, you know, why are you here? Well, you know, mom and dad said they'd pay for it. If I was, you know, if I'd studied business or engineering, I'd really like to be in geology or something, you know, that wouldn't, uh, people haven't really, in our society, it almost is like our purpose has become uh, producing things and consuming things. So I'd say you need a deeper dive on why are you really here? You yeah. know, what are you doing? So uh, in that and really diving into just being aware of your consciousness and who you are and why you're here. And then the third one is uh, clarity, vision, intention, commitment and habits is that uh, really from that place of clarity of who you are, uh, what your purpose is, setting a new vision for your life, which isn't culture's vision, isn't the government's vision of, you know, how big the GDP would be, which is, I'm an economist, there's nothing wrong with GDP, it's great and I love producing things. But again, I not don't look for my happiness in it. Uh, what is my purpose, what do I want to do? And profit's not a purpose. Profit is the outcome of producing a, a you know, a, a good of, of of uh, having a purpose and showing up and doing something that is, is useful to other people and profits a result. It's not a purpose. Yep. So those are the fundamental. And then the commitments and habits are really in, in, important is that I find that all the time people make commitments, but they're out of line with their habits and they're tough to keep because we're habitual creatures about 95 percent science says about 95 percent of what we do is just the next the next habitual thing it's not like we've made a conscious intention we just find ourselves in the refrigerator or wherever it is you know kind of guilty un- guilty yeah me too <laughs> so i have to i spend a lot of time and we do in our program saying okay well here's my commitments and then i have to get rid of some habits and align my habits with my commitments because if they're out of line then you know i'm gonna have a hard time keeping my commitments and then habits as well as you know things happen in life vacation sickness you know viruses all kinds of stuff so i get out of my habits sometimes my commitments are what get me back you know, off of that and get my habits back going. So spending a lot of time saying, are my commitments and my habits going? Because I can't focus on, I mean, I can multitask, but I can't multitask consciously. So I want to be present with who I'm with and what I'm doing in the moment. And I've just found I can train myself that the rest of my, my operating systems can be worked towards my conscious objectives. I can set them and I don't have to worry about them all the time. I automatically work to them if I practiced and honed them in as habits and skills and, and those kind of things. And I can work on being present. So I set up a, 
a system where some things I check on weekly, some things are monthly, some things are quarterly, and I say, how's it going? It's like the rudder. How's it going? Is my, am I meeting my profits? Am I, you know, right within with my measures and those kind of things and if not i alter them in those sessions and then in between i work on presence i just work on being available and being present to people and and uh, showing up okay so, so but, question Translate, yes. it it sounds great to go from commitments to habits mm -hmm. harder than it sounds right we make commitments mm -hmm. via new year's resolutions and all the time. In the moment, promises to ourselves, oh, the diet starts tomorrow. How do we actually make that happen? What advice do you have? Little daily, little daily practices that you do over a long period of time. Start small, start noticing. You know, all, I mean, coming from who you really are, what your life's purpose is helps. Because a lot of times we're just not, what we're doing is not aligned with what we really believe in our core values and our core principles of who we are. So getting that straight first so that we make a commitment, it's actually from a deep place inside us of something that we're really, we're willing to buck culture and buck society because so many times what we've laid out is just what we think that we're supposed to want. The bigger house, the second house, the, the, the Mercedes, the, you know, the trips. But oftentimes what we're really looking for is the feelings or the ways of being that we think those things are gonna generate and they usually don't. Mm -hmm. So getting, making sure those commitments are really valid uh, and spending some time. And I find it's uh, like our mindful leadership program is nine months and a lot of people go, gosh, how did it be so long? It's a start. It takes a while. We start people with two minutes of practice and work them up to 10 minutes over six months, you know, of meditation and what those kind of things. So I think little bit at a time. And another thing that can really help you is a community, at least a, at least a, a mindful friend that you can check in with that is saying, you know, this is what I'm committed to. This is what I'm doing. Or a mindful community that you can, you know, that helps you because uh, on our own, we are, we're, I hate to use the word, but we can be pretty sleazy. <laughs> yeah. You know? But when we have others that are helping support us on this journey, and we say, no, this is what I'm up to, then we're a little more accountable. And then once it gets to be a habit, it's easier. But that that is longer, I find. If it's, if it's something that's bucking culture and you don't have the environment to support, a habit takes quite a bit of time. Yes, it does. You know, and that's why I love mindfulness at work, because then you set an environment and you have other people. We spend so much time at work, eight, 10 hours a day, sometimes more. Yep. If we can do mindfulness at work, then we have that environment. I've got somebody down the hall to have a conversation with a check in. The guys here, you know, it's LC Real Estate Group. You know, they have a morning ninja practice where they're practicing their affirmations and stuff before they get going. They're supporting each other. And somebody doesn't come in. They go, where are you today? You know, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. You know, it's uh, it's very helpful to have a community. Mm -hmm. And to, to your first point in your book, I think the foundation for that is remembering to be present, right? So mm -hmm. that you can pay attention to those things. And I'm dying to show you my tattoo. Please. I got to put my glasses on, though. You're going to have to give I, me a minute. It, it's hard to see, I think, with with the filter, yeah, it may be hard to read. So it's a Balinese lotus flower, and the stem is written in cursive, be present. Oh, so very so cool. A reminder. That I inked it on my wrist. <laughs> I can look at it all day long. And it's, you know, on my best days, I come in and out of presence. So it's always, a, you know, I'm there, and I go away, says, so come, come back, come back come back. I say it's like training a puppy. Just come back, come back, come back, you know, because yes, we're yes. always, things are grabbing our attention and we're going. And then it's just a practice of just generally coming back, coming back, coming back until it becomes my default way of being. You know, again, there I go again with a way of being, but I guess yes. we've talked about it so I can do it now. Yeah, but it's so important. And I find that until people realize that being is equally, if not more important than doing, 
like life is missing a big a big puzzle piece i find that being is what allows me to take those actions and, and you know, take because if i'm in the right state of being i don't i mean people all the time say you know why didn't i take that action why didn't i why can't i get motivated why isn't so and so nice and find your purpose be present and actions just happen we're putting a body to take action and if we're not taking actions look at it how are you aligned with your purpose are you aligned in presence because really well, why else have a body <laughs> right in breath to be able to take action so I, I i i'm all about action so i love it yeah i couldn't agree with you more so show us the book so people know what to look for yeah. Love it. So green, I, I like the connotation of green, fertile, optimism. I, I think all colors have a feeling. And yeah. that's what it feels like to me. And I also make the, the point in the book is, you know, a lot in the mindfulness community kind of feel money is like a dirty word. Not everybody, but some. Yes. And then I hear in the business community that mindfulness is woo woo. You know, it's too soft. It's too time consuming. And I say, no, you know, you got that wrong. Woo-woo is what's going on in the world. Distraction, divisiveness, gridlock. To me, that's woo-woo. And presence or mindfulness is focus, which is all about business. You know, uh, business is focus. That's how we run business. So, so I, 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 with the point, the main point of the book is it's not like I have to get this certain point and then I can be present and mindful. No, you can, presence and mindfulness will help you get to where you want to go now you know and it isn't like either that or profit done done right i mean it can lead you to profit and not only that to mean to a meaningful life where you make a difference then yeah. we know we need to make a profit we're capitalists we need to make a profit but it isn't like that's not why i get up in the morning right you like know, that's just that happens. profit with a purpose yeah i love that book when it came yeah. out I mean, what am what am I gonna what am I gonna do with it? You know, right? You know? And something you can feel good about. Um, exactly. and, and I I also speaking of that and purpose, I think it's really cool that you've been in the real estate business pretty much your entire career and teaching real estate and economics and so forth. And you were on the board of Habitat for Humanity for several yeah. years, so really aligning all of it. Well, and we found, I, I also talk in the book of a concept called the procession effect. And uh, we find that not the reason to do it, but when we go out and give of ourselves in the community, just we set our karma and good things happen. We met other, meet other givers. Yeah. And it's not exclusive of business. I don't go there to get business, but things happen all the time. I tell us several stories in the book of it of you know nice good things happen i meet other people and it's more casual and i get a deeper relationship when they need something they say eric what about this you get to know somebody knows you likes you and trusts you and you're in a deeper relationship than just at a closing table or just a transactional relationship so it's not uh it's not like oh and then i can make time to do that we make it time part of our business you know just to give back yeah. and we found that it's uh it, it it improves business. That's not why to go. I mean, people will smell that on you. Yes. <laughs> so don't yes. go there for that. Yeah, go there to make it different. Your motives, don't they? And then just be aware of what happens because it's how the world works. It, yeah. People people would rather deal with someone that's out giving. So be before we close out, I am curious, and I'm sure some of the folks listening and watching are as well, to learn a little bit more about your mindful leadership program. You said it was Great. nine months. What else do we need to know about it? Well, um, it starts in the in uh, August of each year. We usually have a little bit of, of work we have the folks do in the, in the summertime to get ready for it. Um, and it starts pretty small, you know, just with a couple minutes of meditation and starting reading some some books. And then we work into some intensives. We have nine full days of intensives. There's four in the fall, which are really on covering and trying to really get at or your purpose and and your we we look at uh personality traits that we call sub personalities and mandalas of what different parts of you like i have an entrepreneur part and i have a negotiator i call my way 
what are those parts of ourselves? And also we often have some parts that are, that may be sabotaging our success. Yeah. We look at those and we look at those as, as awareness of those and, and then uh, organize through a, a, our concept of soul, whatever that is, and, and try to, you know, come up with an empowering context that way. And we hone in on practices in the fall, and then we work it towards a visioning uh, intensive in the winter, where we do a vision board, life list, and then we do a complete plan. You know, a full day is writing out a plan and all the important areas of my life, where I am. People aren't generally honest with themselves exactly where they are. So we try to get flat with ourselves where I am and then where I want to go. And then we have a path of development. How do we get from A to B? In the spring, we narrow that down and we work on launching. And we have another two days in April and we, we work on, you know, what are we going to do after? What's our plan? What's our one thing? Those kind of things. So, and we're working with others. So we work with a cohort. We have a support group. There's weekly calls on that. And we have twice monthly Zooms that are not too long, but enough to keep us plugged in. And we're really on that whole time trying to ingrain the habits of mindfulness, the mindsets, the gratitude and affirmation, whatever there is, whatever the ones we need and whatever ones hit us the most, we try to ingrain those so that, so it's a habit. And we're about, you know, bringing, changing the business conversation to be more mindful and more impactful. Is, is part of the program in person or is it all? Oh yeah. All nine days are in person. Okay, that's, yeah. what, that's there are what some check-ins in Zoom because there's people all over the place. But yeah, nine days in person in Northern Colorado. So yeah. we went them at the TPC Colorado Clubhouse. Ah, uh, so. sweet. Yeah. Always great to go do something for yourself, both mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically in the mountains of Colorado, which are magical. It's very great. It's great. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a great setting for it. So how can people find you if they want to sign up for yeah. your program? The, uh, our website has everything, livinginthegap.org, livinginthegap spelled out.org has all our programs. Right now we're three, two thirds of the way through an eight week corporate mindfulness program that we're running in Denver, Northern Colorado. We're going to run a webinar on the book in April and May. That's there six weeks webinar. If you want to you know a little more than just reading the book, want to hear about it a little bit. And then we'll roll into the mindfulness program uh, in the fall. Wonderful. All right, folks, you heard it. Livinginthegap.org. All right. So I really enjoyed this conversation and want to recap it for those of you, not only for those of you who have been listening, but for those of you who maybe joined in late to prompt you to go rewind and listen to the whole thing from the start. So number one, all about that the, your outward success does, is not necessarily what makes you happy. And I bet if we surveyed 99 people out of 100, they'd admit that it wasn't their things, their money, their status that, that makes them happy. There's so many other things in life that bring us joy that we need to think about. And when we're happy because we're doing things that make us more joyful than all the rest of it, the results, the money, the status, the business success, then will fall into place. Um, meditation, a big part of mindfulness and start small, two minutes a day, because if you start too big, it might be too difficult and then you can build on that habit. Uh, the, another thing that I wanted to emphasize, because I thought this part of the conversation was really powerful, is how to align those commitments with the behaviors, because many of us know that it's harder to do than, than we think, right? Easy to say, I, I want to do this, I want to do that, much harder to actually cross the lines, but it translates into those daily habits. So just want to reiterate some of the best practices that Dr. Eric shared with us. First, start with little daily practices, right? You don't have to go for the whole enchilada at once. So once you start with little ones, you can build some little ones on top mm -hmm. of it. Before you know it, you've got a great litany of, of habits. Think about your life purpose to motivate you for that and have a community so that you can check in not only with yourself periodically, but you can check in and have the ongoing support of people who are 
on the same path, not necessarily with the same end goals, but intentionally trying mm -hmm. to translate their intentions to their behaviors. Awesome. Anything you'd add to that as a last word of wisdom? Uh, no, I think you did great. I, I would add that this, you can get this book for pre-sale on Amazon today. Uh, all the proceeds this week go to scholarships for living in the gap programs. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, you can, and it'll be shipped within two weeks. So it's coming up. So no, I thought you did a good job of uh, summarizing it. Great. 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 Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Thoroughly delightful conversation. And leader shifters, thank you for joining us as well. And until next time. Thank you.